The uh, resolution of the feet is much better now, guys. Yeah, hopefully, you know, it stays that way. Yeah, I didn't say it twice, Abdel. No camera, Rich? No, 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 you don't get to see me, Abdel. I need to step away for a couple of minutes. I'll be right back. All right. business stands. Accept credit and debit cards, bank transfer, and mobile pay. Payments made easy with Intuit QuickBooks. Hey, Sony, can you hear that video from the YouTube? Yes. This is Boomer.
Bloomberg Technology and coming up in the next hour, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. Three other passengers make a successful trip to space. In Blue Origin, first crew space launch. Uh, Greg is sitting there with the Yankee cap. Yeah, he's just waiting for something to go bad. the launch from this vantage point uh, it took off right behind me it was surreal it was nerve-wracking at times it was breathtaking and after they came back down to earth I got the first interview with Jeff Bezos and his brother Mark and it was kind of a special moment take a listen to what they had to say welcome back to earth <laughs> how do you feel <laughs> oh my Thank goodness you. wow I mean wow this is your first interview since landing. Yes. We all want to know the reality of seeing the Earth from above. Did it live up to the dream? Uh, beyond, I, honestly, I'm not talented enough to describe this in words. I can't figure it out. It was much more than I expected. It's awe-inspiring. It's just, I don't know, do you have words? I, I don't have words. It, it, was, it was truly, it was one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. So now that you're here, now that you've accomplished this, what's Blue's next move? How does this fit into the long-term vision? Well, the long-term vision, we're building an orbital vehicle called New Glenn, and this vehicle we just flew, New Shepard, is our suborbital tourism vehicle. So we're going to fly that over and over and over, and every time we fly it, it's practice for the orbital mission. And it gives people a chance to see what we just saw, which is this fragile, beautiful Earth that you can't imagine. People can tell you about it, but until you see it with your own eyes, I don't know, maybe we need to send a poet up or something, <laughs> somebody who would be better at describing it. What I can tell you is that it's, uh, it's just this thing that you can't tell. You can see that it's just one place. There's no boundaries, no national lines, nothing. The, the atmosphere, we see this thing, it's Earth's atmosphere. It's so big, we live in it, and it seems gigantic. But when you get up there, you see that it's actually this teensy little thing that we need to protect. Uh, so, I don't know, for me it was definitely incredible. Yeah, it was amazing. I was surprised at how easy it was to move around in zero G. That was the, probably the most surprising thing. Yeah, it felt almost normal. It felt, it very felt like, you know, it felt like we were somehow evolved to be in zero G. It felt so good. Yeah. So, so, for the people here on Earth who are wondering why are we investing all this money in space, this time in space, talk to us about how you believe this will actually help benefit us here on Earth. Yeah, well, this is what we're doing is we're building infrastructure. This is a road. We're building a road to space so that future generations can build the future. We live on this beautiful planet. It's the most beautiful planet in the solar system by far. And we have to keep it safe and protect it. And the way to do that is slowly over decades to move all heavy industry, all polluting industry out into space. That's what we're going to do so we can keep this planet the gym that it is. But to do that, we need reusable spacecraft. We need low-cost spacecraft. And to get that, we've got to practice. Got to start and that's here. what this tourism mission is about. We saw your kids greet you on the ground. Yeah. I'm back. Kids, for the kids watching, what, how do you want this to inspire them? Well, they're going to, you know, kids are, they are all, if every kid has so much potential inside of them. And what I hope that what we're doing a little bit and is, un, is unlocking that. So for kids everywhere, if you, the way you unlock potential is with inspiration. I was inspired as a little boy by the Apollo astronauts, and you know this is the next phase of commercial space development, and I hope that inspires little kids too. And by the way, uh, the first person to hug Jeff Bezos after this flight was his mother. Keep in mind, she had two sons on this flight. So as a mom, 
I sympathize. We also got to go with him to the landing pad right after that. We saw you know, where the rocket touched down, and the key, as he said, is reusability, and that rocket is ready to go back up again. And I said, when are you going next? And he said, tomorrow. Uh, so he was clearly in a, a jubilant mood. I want to bring in our Ed Ludlow, who's also been with us on the ground here on the streets of Van Horn, Texas, which is home to Blue Origin. Ed, the big question is, what's next for Blue? What is the road to space tourism? They've said they've got a couple more flights planned this year. What else do we know? Yeah, two flights for the rest of this year. The thing is that this space tourism business is so supply constrained. You know, uh, Bob Smith, the Blue Origin CEO, was saying over the weekend that there are willing and paying customers out there. Remember, the fourth seat on this mission was supposed to go to that auction winner who bid $28 million, but we're told by Blue Origin there were others that were bidding in the region of $20 million, and we're still trying to get a sense of how Blue Origin would go about pricing and charging this. But two missions this year, six paying customers on each, potentially six missions next year, next year the, the, the constraint is they only have a couple of boosters able to do this they need to build more and then remember Jeff was pretty candid in that interview you Emily that this part of the business is just a small part of a much broader plan much greater ambitions let's talk about that greater ambition because new Shepherd going up and down taking tourists to space is one thing new Glenn is what they're working on now they say that's gonna be ready towards the end of next year that will do orbital missions, much more like what SpaceX is working on. When Blue Origin right. starts doing orbital missions, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, look, this is a really important day for Blue Origin and a really positive day, but it's been a long time coming. Jeff Bezos founded this company in 2000, and since then, they've really fallen behind SpaceX. They were so focused on this narrow issue of sending paying customers to suborbital space that SpaceX pulled far ahead when it comes to those orbital launches, when it comes to carrying commercial payload for NASA, for private sector customers. Blue Origin wants to be in and amongst those contracts. We know that SpaceX was awarded the Lunar Lander contract, for example, for the Artemis program 2024. Blue Origin has appealed that decision. Today, Jeff Bezos was talking about how this validates their technology. He said that New Shepard is completely overkill in terms of rocket technology that it takes to get to suborbital flight. So confident that they can go beyond that, but now they have to prove it and they have to go out and win those contracts. Do you imagine that this successful flight, this demonstration of force, of technology, puts Blue Origin in a better position with respect to NASA? It gives them visibility. You know that I'm a space romantic, right? This is just brilliant that we have the world's richest man, the world's youngest astronaut, the world's oldest astronaut, and then some guy called Mark, his brother, taking this flight. You know, it proves that Blue Origin is a genuine player in the eyes of the public, in the eyes of those politicians and administrators that award these kinds of contracts. They have good technology. Um, but remember that what's going on over my shoulder where you are, they're not just sending out these rockets for uh, suborbital space flight. They're testing engines that they're building for others like ULA. They're testing their other technologies, and they have a roadmap in place now to put those into the real world, or out of this world, I guess I should say. So, so give us the atmosphere from the streets of Van Horn, Texas, where I know people are very proud, uh, signs uh, throughout the town, wishing them well, and, and today, you know, they clearly pulled it off. They've been incredibly sweet and incredibly sincere. One rancher who's been here his entire life has massive acreage nearby with his cattle told me this is the most exciting thing to happen in his lifetime. You know, this is a town of 2,000 people, a two mile stretch of road with a couple of truck stops at either end. There is nothing here, respectfully. And they've long hoped that Blue Origin would bring a space boom. It hasn't happened since the company arrived here 15 years ago, but there is a genuine feeling now that it will. One small step for Jeff Bezos, one giant leap for space exploration, and a really exciting <laughs> day for the town of Van Horn, Texas at Ludlow. Thank you so much, um, Caroline. A lot of emotion here. I think a lot of people are still processing this. We talked to employees on the ground here, and, and they're just in awe. It has been a huge haul leading up to this, and you know, today is a day to celebrate, certainly, for Blue Origin. What a poetic pair you are, and what an amazing first interview that you managed to get running over to him, Emily. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, quite the day for Blue Origin. Meanwhile, it was quite the day for stocks, too. I mean, those Kriti-Gupta's got more, and what a bounce back. Absolutely, Caroline. You did see green on the screen today, the biggest rally since March. But I really want to take it back to, really, that Blue Origin story, because you wouldn't at the top of it 
think that this is a market story, but it absolutely is, Caroline. Just take a look at this. A risk on day in broader markets. So that, of course, lifted Amazon, Tesla, but Virgin Galactic down on day. One of the very few stocks that were down today. This, of course, in reaction to that launch. And, of course, in pre-market trading, you did see, as Jeff Bezos was ascending into the air, Amazon share prices were as well. And, of course, dropping were Tesla share prices as well as Virgin Galactic. So, once again, a very clear read-through into the market from that launch. But let's just zoom out for a second and see how some of those space ETFs were doing because this is at the end of the day, well, we've got a different chart here, but I do want to point out those space ETFs year to date haven't been performing very well. So I do want to point out some of those ARC uh, holdings, Kathy Wood's top ARC holdings in that space exploration ETF, excuse me. These are them, look at that green on the screen, all thinking that they're going to be thriving off of that Bloomberg, or excuse me, that space economy investment. I was going to say that Bloomberg is actually really uh, monitoring this. You can find this all on the Bloomberg Terminal and, of course, the Bloomberg Markets Live blog. We love you on the M Live blog. Do tune in to everything that Creepy writes throughout the day. Meanwhile, we want to thank you for that upcoming. We've still got the investment in space that Creepy was just discussing. Could be seen as high risk, but Kathy Woods, Ark Invest, wants you to trust in the company's ETF. We talked to analyst Sam Curris about the company's big bet. That's next. And we have to talk about Netflix shares in the streaming titan. Well, reversing losses in extended trading. Now up after its subscriber forecast did though miss estimates. What are now in an analysts and investors liking? We'll dig into the call after the show. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. The world's first fully autonomous vehicle is almost at the finish line. What a ride. I invested in Invesco QQQ, a fund that invests in the innovators of the NASDAQ 100, yeah. like you. Become an agent of innovation with Invesco QQQ. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang, live in Van Horn, Texas, where Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, and his crew have pulled off a safe and successful launch shuttling human beings to space for the very first time landing without a hitch when he got to the ground bezos talked to us about building a road to space building out a future space economy so what does that mean for investing let's talk about that i want to bring in sam chorus of arc investment management and analyst in industrial innovation sam uh, so curious for your thoughts on this and what this means for the investment community this is a successful launch you know when it comes to actually Putting, putting your money somewhere, placing bets now that Jeff Bezos has pulled this off. Where are you looking? Yeah, I mean, you have Blue Origin with a successful launch. You had Virgin Galactic with a successful launch. You've got SpaceX out there who's now taking humans to the International Space Station. What better way to show that we're in a new space age? And so when we're looking at that, when we structured our fund ARKS, we're trying to bucket into four different areas. So we're looking at orbital aerospace. That's the rockets and the satellites, the suborbital aerospace. So you have space tourism there and some high flying drones that are acting as pseudo satellites. Then you have got all of these enabling technologies coming together. So you have 3D printing that's making it possible. You've got energy storage, which is super important. Uh, you've got deep learning and artificial intelligence for these uh, autonomous drones. And then you've got the aerospace beneficiaries. And these are the companies that are going to benefit here on Earth from all of the space activity that's going on. So that's how we think about and structure now, the portfolio. Now, Bezos told me repeatedly today, this is not about escaping Earth. This is about protecting Earth. He believes Earth is the best planet. This is where we're going to want to live forever. But we're going to run out of resources, and we need to tap those resources in space. Solar energy, water from the moon. For example, that's a very different vision than what Elon Musk has put forward. He's looking to Mars. Uh, perhaps uh, Earth will become uh, inhabitable. We'll need to move to Mars. I know Kathy Wood, who of course runs ARC, is a huge fan of Elon Musk. Uh, do you see those visions being at odds? And how does that influence your strategy? I don't think they're at odds at all. I think if we look at it today, the internet is becoming more and more of a basic human need. Uh, and right now, half the Earth's population, so like 3 billion people, don't have access to internet. And one of the ways that we're going to bring them affordable internet is through satellite internet. And so, you know, I think a lot of memes get put out there about billionaires going to space. 
But all of this activity is driving down costs, and it's going to enable very affordable Internet for the global population. I don't think we can overstate how important that is. So let's talk about cost. I mean, the tip of the iceberg here is space tourism. That is what Virgin Galactic is focused on. It's a very small part of what Blue Origin is focused on, but it's just the beginning, and it's a way that they're going to be able to make money, at least in the short term. What do you think is the real market for space tourism, and at what cost for a ticket? Sure. So I think a lot of framing for space tourism gets put into the fact that people will spend 1% of their net worth on an incredible experience. Going to space, I think, would definitely fit in that category. And so when you look at that, you really need to bring costs down to roughly $50,000 per ticket for space tourism to become, you know, to reach that inflection point where more people can do it. But we really think, and I think Jeff Bezos agrees, that space tourism is kind of just a way to test technology. It's a good way to commercialize it at an early stage, but he's already overpowering it. What we really see as the big opportunity is potential hypersonic point-to-point transportation. So that's not just going up for a few minutes and then coming back to the same spot. That would be going from New York to Japan in a few hours. And we think that, you know, over the medium term, that could be a $270 billion revenue opportunity annually. Or you look at the satellite Internet opportunity, and that could be $40 billion in revenue annually. So space tourism is really the first step, not what we see as the main opportunity. Now, so much of the vision is hundreds of years out. Bezos has made it clear. Some of these things that he's talking about won't happen in our generation or our kids' generation or even for our children's children. How do you balance making investments for a vision that is so far away versus what can actually benefit us here in the near term? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's definitely the 100-year vision, but with technology, it's moving incredibly quickly. So if you go back five years ago, no one would have said that we could have had a reusable rocket. Here we are today where rocket landings are becoming commonplace. If we look at the active satellites orbiting Earth, roughly half of those are SpaceX Starlink satellites. So this is happening very quickly, and I think the benefits we're going to see from it are going to happen far faster than people think. If you go back, you know, 10, 15 years, the cost to get any mass to orbit was in the tens of thousands of dollars, so roughly $12,000 to low Earth orbit. Now with SpaceX, that's come down to roughly $2,000. With the next generation of rockets coming out, that could come down to $200. And all of this is in the five-year time horizon. So we think that these opportunities that we're investing in, it is a longer-term time horizon than, say, investing for the next quarter, but ARC does always take that longer-term time horizon of five years. And we think that we're going to see an enormous amount of opportunity and commercialization in space in that time frame. All right, Sam Corris of ARC Investment Management. It certainly is exciting to talk about. Appreciate you taking the time to join us. We're going to have much more from Van Horn, Texas, and this windy day uh, and successful launch for Jeff Bezos when we return. This is Bloomberg. Know where you stand and get your funds instantly. That's payments made easy with Intuit QuickBooks. Concerning news once again from the CDC on Tuesday that the Delta variant now makes up 83% of COVID cases in the United States. And it's the growing concern over these figures that prompted some companies to well, we think their return to work plans, including Apple. Now, the iPhone maker is now delaying its office return deadline by at least a month. Bloomberg Technologies, Mark Diamond, broke the story and joins us now from Los Angeles. And so talk to us about what their return plans had been and what they now look like. Yes, so Apple had been aiming to have all employees back in the offices globally by the beginning of September, in the first two weeks of September. 
on a plan that would see employees in the office on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays with remote work optional for some employees on Wednesdays and Fridays. Now they're delaying that return to offices until October 1st uh, at the earliest, so about a one month delay or so. But my understanding is that this is more of an indefinite delay and Apple's going to give staff a one month notice uh, before a return is ultimately required. Okay, and so then are they rethinking that plan, that model that they've put in place in terms of the certain days working and certain remote, is that gonna evolve as well, do you think, Mark? Uh, as of now, that same three-day plan, two-day remote plan uh, is in place. This is a hybrid plan that they're going to be launching upon that return, and it's going to last into 2022. At that time, Apple's going to reevaluate what needs to be done, whether that's allowing more remote options or if that is to tighten things up and require five days back into the office. But I think a lot of that is dependent both on employee feedback and with the COVID-19 situation we just discussed. Mark, it almost felt like Apple stores were at one point almost a sort of arbiter of where we were in the COVID journey and Apple's decision making on opening and then shutting them. Where are we in the store process and, and what's protocol like? I agree with you. Apple is often a barometer through this whole process, both for the stock market, what other companies are doing, and the situation with COVID in general. So based on that logic, I have bad news for you because now after about a month, Apple's having masks back on as a requirement for many retail store employees. Uh, about half the stores across the U.S. are now going to require uh, retail store employees to wear masks once again after, after dropping that requirement in mid-June. Uh, and in addition, they're urging the mask requirement for uh, the rest of all the retail staff globally. So required in, in some states, but strongly recommended elsewhere. And also that global nature, you know, the return to office. Is that all looking the same, whether it be in Cupertino or elsewhere? Uh, Apple's return to office plan is the same globally. Uh, of course, that October, September date, that time frame, that was a deadline, right? That was sort of when the, the last time where you're able to come in to, to meet the requirements. There are already many Apple employees back. Uh, there are offices in Asia, the Asia Pacific area, some of the offices in Europe, right? Those are already you know, pretty much filled up. It's in Silicon Valley where you're seeing some engineers, you know, really concerned about returning. Mark German, always scoop after scoop. We thank you, Bloomberg Technologies, Mark. Thank you. Meanwhile, coming up, no royal treatment for Netflix. It's a streaming giant forecast sluggish growth. We'll dive into the numbers after the break. Plus. We're here at the landing pad, and this is the rocket that just took Jeff Bezos to space, and he hopes that millions will follow him. We'll head back to Van Horn for more of our coverage of Blue Origin's successful space launch and what this means for the future of space tourism. This is Blue Mad. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyder in for Emily Chang. And let's get more, of course, on the big earnings to kick things off. Netflix. Pretty good to Scott Moore. Absolutely, Caroline. 1.5 million subscribers last quarter. That's compared to the 1.1 million estimate. Now, of course, that's going to be last quarter. The real game changer is what's happening next quarter. So immediately when those earnings hit, you saw a little bit of a drop. The estimate there being 5.9 million subscribers. Netflix only saying next quarter, they only see 3.5. That really tanked the stock until recently where we started to see some of those losses recouped in after hours trading. But I really want to show you what happened with some of its competitors hey, during the day. This is some intraday charts, charting of some of its competitors. Right. Disney, Comcast, yeah. Viacom, all involved in those streaming services. During the day, they actually held up Netflix going into their earnings story after the close. 30 minutes before the close start to see their stock drop. You did not see that in some of these other stocks. It is worth mentioning though, Caroline, in after hours trading when those Netflix results came out, you did start to see some of these names trade in sympathy. The question is, does that continue on to tomorrow? We'll just have to wait and see. I do wanna broaden it out before I let you go into some of the other sectors of tech because today was a risk on day. And when it came to tech, it did not discriminate. You did see, of course, the NASDAQ 100 much, much higher not as big as uh, some of the cyclical names, but still a 1.2% gain is nothing to scoff at. And of course that came down to semiconductors, biotech stocks, and even those Chinese ADRs, which Caroline, we know those have been under pressure because of those regulatory scrutiny today, they attracted investors. Crypto didn't play though, still down. Kuri Gupta, 
always great to get her analysis across these markets. Let's dig back into Netflix where she started. Shares were down as much as 6% at one point in late trading, now managing to push back higher. But we're still worrying about the subscriber forecast. Analysts, as Kuti was saying, 5.8 million they saw. Well, they're getting a guidance of 3.5 million coming from Netflix. They're always pretty conservative, but is this more than we're expecting? Andre Swanson's with us of True Optic to discuss his earnings report. And Andre, I know you're a man who thinks that it shouldn't all be about subscriber growth, but were you taken aback by the future forecast? Um, I was a little bit. Um, in, in terms of, I, I think everybody has known that the international is where the growth opportunity has been, probably for the better part of the last two years. Uh, 2020, because of the, the, the COVID bounce, so to speak, I think the domestic number was a bit inflated. Um, I, I think the bigger concern, though, which which I've been sounding the alarm on for some time, is that is that Netflix really needs to diversify their revenue stream. Uh, they were the first mover, you know, all the way back when it came to DVDs and then streaming and then international. Um, um, but they've really been lagging behind the other competitors in terms of way to, ways to diversify that revenue stream. And with the, the slowing subscriber numbers, I think uh, a, a wider street is probably more concerned about that now. And to actually see 400,000 subscribers lost in the second quarter in North America, that's something to really make you sit up and listen. And therefore, they have been starting to hint at ways of diversifying. Of course, they're offering gaming, a story that our own Mark Gurman and Lucas Shaw broke for Bloomberg. What do you think of that move into gaming? Because, as you say, they're a little bit behind. Well, the move to gaming is one that I've, I've been talking about for quite some time. I think the, the general strategy uh, that I think m myself and others have shared is that Gaming was a natural evolution for Netflix because of the, the shift to cloud gaming and streaming and their large subscriber base. Uh, also, another way to diversify would be adding a, a cheaper ad-supported tier. Um, the, the one concern that I would have if I were them relative to gaming, um, normally they are the first mover in everything that they've been successful at from the, the, the founding of the company. Um, and they've also been able to outspend historically others. But when it comes to, to these cloud-based stream and gaming, they're, they're amongst the last uh, to do so. Uh, and they're, they're really not going to be able to outspend Microsoft and Amazon and others in the space. And so will they have to uh, acquire a gaming studio or do other things uh, to make that more of a viable uh, expansion opportunity for them? Why don't you think they can outspend? They're looking to up their spending on content to $12 billion. What stops them being able to catch up organically if they just threw money at the situation? So what we've seen over the same period, you know, say in 2021, where their subscriber growth has dramatically slowed on the, the, the streaming video side, you've seen other diversified media companies, the, the Comcast, the, the Viacom, uh, CBS, and others that have their uh, uh, ad-supported uh, AVOD solutions as well as, as well as SVOD solutions have massive growth. Hey, Sonny, only were you looking at the live stream? Ad dollars and ad revenue uh, time spent and then they have many other uh, revenue streams as well. And so the concern is if, if everybody else is starting to see more and more time and more and more audience on their streaming solutions, that's even more motivation for their competitors to spend more. Um, and then their competitors have other revenue streams. And so, you know, Netflix spends 12 billion, what's, what's to stop Amazon from spending 13 or 14 or others? And so I, I just don't think that at, it was okay to get into that arms race when other people weren't really playing five years ago and they were kind of spending against themselves. Uh, but now there's a ton of competition from companies that are, uh, are, are, are really ready to, to, to take that next step. Okay, so let's talk about diversification, not just only in offering it to gaming, but you talk about this ad model, which you know I immediately start to think of Spotify, for example, where you can have these two layers, a cheaper version, ad supported, or, or a premium version. And Spotify, of course, have been diversifying, getting more into podcasts and the like. What do you make of, of other areas in which Netflix can diversify its revenue? Look, I, I think the, the, the trifecta would be for Netflix to really be a, a behemoth when it comes to what I call the watch, listen, play strategy. So they already are the, the leader in terms of watch, right? In terms of the way they have streaming. Uh, listening would be music. You know, you know, buying a Spotify or, 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 or getting into streaming. They have a massive consumer base all over the world and, and could do so. And the play is, you know, there's more gamers and more time spent and attention and more revenue in gaming. Than, than, than TV and, and music combined. And so that's something that they've already shown they're getting into. But you know, with the ability to, to distribute content over the internet all over the world, I feel like they're missing out on lots of revenue opportunity and kind of just tripling down on their core competency. 
um, which you know didn't work well for Blockbuster, and, and that's uh, so. You know, we'll see how that works. For uh, I'm sure they they know well the Blockbuster story, and having having seen it unfold in front of their eyes and been the reason for their demise. What's your take on the global story here? Because when you're looking at the numbers, Europe is a bit of a slowdown, Latin America as well. I thought these were the areas that they should be really showing sort of serious strength in. Yeah, so what you're also seeing is in these markets, there's local players that have access to, that have the rights to a lot of the local in-language content in certain markets. And so that has put, over the last few years, uh, a lot of pressure on Netflix to produce original content in those markets, uh, which they've actually done quite well at uh, and had some, some huge success and also been able to bring back uh, some of that content domestically with, mm. with some models and so forth. Um, I, I think in some of these markets you're seeing, which I, which I think is concerning, you're seeing less opening up uh, post-COVID than you have in the U.S. And so if they're, even though there's still a lot of lockdowns and, and less of the open economy in some of these markets, for them seeing subscriber growth would, would, would also be a slight concern as well. Really interesting stuff. Of course, Money Heist, many people's favorite and still waiting for the next iteration of that to come onto their screen soon. Who Optic, CEO Andre Swanson. Really great to have some time with you. Thank you for the deep dive. Meanwhile, I want to talk about another story. The White House has confirmed that President Biden will name a long-term Google critic as the head of the Justice Department's Antitrust Division. This move to nominate Jonathan Cantor is the latest sign that the administration is preparing a broad crackdown on big tech. For more on this Bloomberg scoop, we're joined by Bloomberg reporter Jordan Fabian from Washington, D.C. I made a mouth movement because Jonathan Cantor, we know, has been pretty anti-alphabet for years now. So, so what does that mean for big tech, Google, and, and its competitors? Well, the most immediate consequence, if Mr. Cantor is confirmed for that position, is this existing antitrust lawsuit against Google that's been filed by the federal government, which is uh, going after uh, their search business and accusing them of uh, cutting deals with Apple and other uh, companies about uh, for, for distribution. So uh, I think that would be the first battlefield uh, that, that Cantor would fight this fight on. Uh, but also there's a, another lawsuit that could be refiled against Facebook and so uh, there's certainly a lot of issues here that are bubbling up, uh, and that will be an immediate charge for Mr. Cantor again if he is confirmed. Let's just line up, Jordan, sort of the, the timelines for all of these things, because we sort of have felt for a long time that this administration is serious about antitrust, and there's a focus not only from some of the regulators, but also from Congress itself in terms of changing law. But then we think it's going to be all focus, and then the FTC backs away from some of its law, well, is it ha pushed away in terms of its focus on Facebook, for example. So what's the most imminent antitrust threat, shall I call it that, to facing some of these big tech companies right now? Well, I, I think if you're looking at sort of processes, you look at the FTC and you look at Congress, it takes longer time for them to act because on the FTC, you need a majority of that five-member panel to move ahead with actions. Congress can take even longer to pass uh, you know, new antitrust laws into effect that would impact technology companies. The, the, the Justice Department, the, the antitrust chief, has wide latitude to file lawsuits and to push ahead with litigation against these companies. And so I, th I would think you would look to that division, the antitrust division, for the most immediate action on some of these issues facing big tech companies. Bloomberg News, Jordan Fabian on the news there. Interestingly, Alphabet still rose 1.3%, so investors are not too worried about it imminently. Meanwhile, coming up, we continue our conversation about the future of the space industry. The CEO of a 3D rocket printing startup. Oh, and did we tell you who started out at Blue Origin? That's next. This is Bloomberg. Chang live in West Texas where Jeff Bezos has achieved a victory of historic proportions launching and landing a rocket carrying humans for the very first time again this was a, a journey 21 years in the making many Blue Origin employees uh, worked very hard over all those years to make this dream a reality one of them was Tim Ellis who, who worked at Blue Origin for several years then went on to found his own 
rocket making company, Relativity Space. Tim Ellis, CEO of Relativity, joining us now to reflect on what we saw here today. And Tim, I'm so curious for you as a Blue Origin employee, former Blue Origin employee who knows so much about what went on behind the scenes here, the blood, the sweat, the tears. What was it like for you to watch this today? Well, it was a pretty, pretty awesome moment. I first started as an intern at Blue Origin. I actually interned three times back to back to back, uh, starting in 2011. So the whole company was only about 150 people at the time. And, and because of the small size, I've actually kept in touch with Jeff uh, dur during the years. Um, he even came out to visit us not, not too long ago at Relativity. So I've been a huge fan ever since I've left. And it really is pretty amazing, not just to see Blue Origin fly, um, but also Virgin Galactic, you know, just a little bit before. So really two pretty huge human spaceflight milestones right, right next to each other. Pretty amazing. So what does this all mean? And, you know, obviously having worked here, understanding a little bit more how Jeff Bezos thinks, when he landed, he articulated to me this vision again of building a road to space, uh, building out a space economy in a way to protect the Earth. What do you imagine the next move for Blue Origin will be? What is the next priority? Yeah, so de definitely the New Shepard program and you know, I think Jeff made a bold move to fly on the first, uh, the first human, the human capsule flight. Uh, but of course, this has been in testing for a long time. Uh, they're also developing an orbital rocket called New Glenn, which seeks to be reusable for the first stage. It's quite huge, so it's a heavy lift rocket um, that they're launching from Cape Canaveral, and uh, you know that's going to be a huge milestone. But to your, to your point on vision, I think you know, as I, I've talked to Jeff and heard him speak as well, it's really about having millions of people living and working in space and moving heavy industry off planet Earth in, into space itself. And I think that's really what inspired me to start Relativity was this idea that um, we need to actually build an industrial base on, on Mars and on other planets and that this is a really important vision to go after. Um, you know, of course, I think there's a lot of conversation around this that, you know, this is just billionaires launching themselves into space and that there's so many problems on Earth. But I think we do have to actually, as a species and civilization, think about what is the future vision of humanity and what is this all about? And, and it's very worthwhile to have a small fraction of our resources going to, to making this amazing future in space happen. Now, the key to building out that space economy is obviously reusability. It's something that I, I know occurred to you while you were working here. You're now focused on 3D printing rockets. You know, if you could achieve that, what would that pave the way for? How would that go towards building out the future space economy? Yeah, of course. So, so first off, I think 3D printing and reusability are not mutually exclusive. So Relativity is actually now designing a fully reusable, uh, entirely 3D printed rocket. So the first stage and second stage and payload terrain will all be reused. Uh, it's our newest rocket called Terranar, which we're actually currently uh, nearly complete printing the first dome for it. That's the 16-foot diameter dome. Um, so we're already building it. And really, 3D printing is at the forefront of software-driven manufacturing. So I see it as an automation technology. I actually started the metal 3D printing program at Blue Origin uh, before I started Relativity. And you know, I think they're still doing amazing things with 3D printing rocket engine chambers and, and parts of, of their product. But I really saw the future being a whole new tech stack for aerospace. That if we could print not just bits and parts of a rocket, but the entire thing, and throw away all of the old factory and build a whole new way of doing things, that this would really be the, the future of, of space and seeing that happen much faster. So going from raw material to a rocket complete in less than 60 days is the target I've set for the team, and, and we're certainly going to achieve that over the next couple of years. Now, if there's one thing we've learned about space is that these milestones take a long time to hit. Obviously, this was a long journey for Blue, and certainly if you go back in uh, space development history, uh, we're going back decades. And I'm curious if there were times at, at, while you were working here where you thought, this is so hard, I don't know if we can pull it off. Uh, if you have those moments still today, working on such hard, difficult technology where, where, where literally lives are at stake. Yeah, it's, I mean, for sure it's it's hard and challenging. I think that's actually partially what draws some of the best engineers in the U.S. to, to making the space industry happen. 
And, and it blew words in, no, I, I always thought that Jeff and the team over there were gonna get it done. Um, I was really confident about it. That's why I decided to work there. And, and clearly today is a, is a huge milestone that, that I hope they're celebrating really hard um, because there's a ton of hard work into it. But I really think over the last couple of years, the pace of milestones in the, the rocket industry, satellites, companies getting private funding from, from venture capital has accelerated extraordinarily to, to a pace not seen before. I think that will continue as long as people execute. And I think it's really just bringing that Silicon Valley ethos into an aerospace world where we test things, we try things out uh, very quickly. It's all about rate of learning, trying new ideas. I um, mean, you're really seeing th that pay off now with, uh, with the pace of innovation that's happening. All right, well, we're certainly seeing the private rocket industry taking off so to speak. Tim Ellis, CEO of Relativity, thanks so much for sharing your perspective here with us. We're gonna have more on Jeff Bezos' historic trip to space from Texas after the break. This is Bloomberg. Let's don't forget because people say, what in the world is this doing for us on our lives on the face of the earth? Look at all the spin-offs. Look at all the discoveries. Look at all the new technology that improves our lives. There's a lot of spin-offs coming from the space program. NASA Administrator there, Bill Nelson, outlining the benefits of all this renewed interest in space exploration. Let's get back to today's space accomplishments and head to Van Horn, Texas, where both Ed Bloomberg's Emily Chang and Brad Stone were able to watch Jeff Bezos head to space firsthand. And Emily, first and foremost, just the excitement seems so palpable. The excitement was palpable. You definitely held your breath for a moment. The rocket took off and uh, there was a moment where I was just watching it and suddenly it occurred to me again that Jeff Bezos and three other people were on that rocket and were they going to make it? It was intense and it also just went so fast. Remember, this is an 11 minute trip up and down after two and a half mi minutes, their separation and the crew capsule is going onward and upward into space. So uh, it, it, I, I liken it to a roller coaster, but maybe twice as long. <laughs> it was quick. Uh, you know, I want to know, I want to know from Brad because he's been covering Amazon and Jeff Bezos since 1999, when it was just a shell of an online bookstore. Brad, what was taking in that moment like for you? I agree, Emily, it was electric. It was a great day for Blue Origin. The eyes of the world were on the company, were on here, uh, uh, Bezos' ranch outside Van Horn, Texas. But you know, I'm struck by how Blue Origin really desperately needed this day. I mean, this is a 20-year-old company that's been working on a suborbital spaceship for really more than 15 years and didn't have a lot to show for it. So today was sort of validating for Bezos. It puts Blue Origin kind of back in the game. And, it, and that's a game really where, frankly, SpaceX has kind of dominated over the past few years. So given that you've written a couple of books about Amazon and Jeff Bezos, the big question is, what's next for him? He talked about spending a lot more time at Blue Origin, a lot more time on the Bezos Earth Fund. Um, but what do you think the next chapter right. of the Bezos journey will be? It's interesting. The Bezos Earth Fund, $10 billion to fight climate change. He announced today this $200 million in awards uh, for what he was calling the Courage and Civility Fund. I think it's a kind of solutionism, like looking at the biggest problems and, use, and, and having a faith that technology can help solve them. And so I think we're going to see a lot of kind of big, bold swings from Bezos and also in his personal life, right? He's building this yacht. He bought the Geffen estate for $165 million last year. He seems to be kind of moving into a stage of his career where he just kind of wants to do big things. Emily, you made it personal in that way, asking that question of him as like you as a mother of four, him hugging his own mother as he came off on board. It was a deeply emotional moment and probably terrifying, I'm sure. But tell us about, you know, there's also been this deep criticism of billionaires basically racing each other and what that money could also be spent on. How do you feel he fended off that criticism, Brad, just speaking of the money he gave away today? Well, look, he, he, he insisted over and over again that this was not about escaping Earth. This was about improving Earth. And, uh, you know, it's not about going to Mars or living on another planet. It's about tapping 
resources in the solar system, whether it's solar energy or water from the moon, to power the future that we want on the most beautiful planet that we know. And I, I thought it was really interesting. Brad and I were both in, in this press conference today. And Brad, I'm curious what you thought of him giving away all that money at the end. What did you make of that? He, I, I think he's, he's at a moment in his career where, one, I think he's receptive to the criticism of billionaires and him in particular as the wealthiest person in the world. And two, he's, he's, he's looking to create solutions. And I think he's been disturbed, probably like a lot of the rest of us, in how public discourse has turned so uh, uncivil and dysfunctional. And this is an attempt to correct it, and we'll see if it works. Of course, Van Jones himself. Caroline, would you take one. a seat? <laughs> yes. We, we've been taking bets. Would you take a seat if you were offered? Yeah, definitely. Whether I'd, I have to negotiate with my husband Brad? and my kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brad? You know, after today, I might consider it. They, they, might, they made it seem, you know, pretty enticing. How about you, Emily? I don't know. I FaceTimed with my kids after the launch, and I decided I had to wait a little longer. So jury's still out there, but it was still an amazing day. Yeah, we're going to make you made it amazing, guys, out there. We brought it all to life. We thank you. What a long day. Go rest up. Enjoy. That's it from Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in tomorrow. We've got so many guests for you. This is Bloomberg. Accept credit and debit cards, bank transfer, and mobile pay. Payments made easy with Intuit QuickBooks. From the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide, in Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. in New York, in for Emily Chang, who's somewhere in Texas looking at the space race, and this is Bloomberg Technology. And coming up in the next hour, we're heading straight to her in Van Horn, Texas, where Emily is standing by at Blue Origin launch site to find out what to expect when Amazon founder Jeff Bezos heads to space. Plus, Robinhood sets its sights on a $35 billion valuation in its IPO. It could be the fifth biggest on a U.S. exchange in this record-setting year for public offerings. And Global Foundries is looking to rebrand itself amid a chip shortage why the change in image and how it could impact the larger industry. We chat with the CEO later this hour. First and foremost, we've got to get into the stock slump today. Around the world, warnings, of course, from health officials of a resurgence of COVID-19, plus an escalation in tensions between the US and China had investors destabilized. Kuti Gupta, you got the market movements. Absolutely, Caroline. It was a really big confluence, a market's jambalaya of what I call a risk factor, kind of stew is really what you're seeing. And just take a look at this, S&P 500 down 1.6% today, and you really saw tech just a little bit more insulated than some of those other sectors. Take a look at this, the NASDAQ 100 down almost 1%, but if you compare it to the S&P 500, it's just not that bad, Caroline. Go even bigger in market cap to some of those big tech stocks, and you're only down 0.7%. This, of course, coming as you start to see yields down as well, a whopping 10 basis points. So, Caroline, where did all the money go? Treasuries is a given, but where else did it go? It went into the dollar. You can really see that up 0.3%. And there were little pockets of tech that actually did well. Semiconductors, which at one point were the most hit on the day, coming off some of those geopolitical headlines. It looks like it came back. People bought that dip when it comes to semis. And then, of course, the Nasdaq Biotech Index. You know, I don't have a reason for that, but somewhere, somehow, People are into healthcare tech stocks, I should say. I do also want to mention our big after hours earnings story. IBM reporting second quarter earnings with a massive revenue beat. And this, of course, making it their best revenue growth since 2018, citing cloud demand. So that, of course, sending shares up after hours, Caroline. We'll be digging into that IBM story much more in a little bit, but Kuti Gupta, thank you so much. Meanwhile, let's get straight to Van Horn, Texas. The world's richest person is set to launch into space on Tuesday. Bloomberg Technologies, Emily Chang, of course, she's in the scene. How does it feel? Hot, I imagine. Caroline, it is hot, it is windy. We see storms and clouds overhead, but apparently that's the weather in West Texas. And we just got a surprise visit from the man himself. Jeff Bezos came in to deliver dinner to the press corps. Chicken thighs, mac and cheese, and black-eyed peas. Apparently it's his mother's favorite recipe. He said he's finished up his training for the day. He's still feeling really excited. Didn't indicate uh, any nerves, though someone did ask if this was his last meal. Uh, 
before the flight, and he said, who's saying anything about last meal? We're not going to go there. Uh, so it seems like all systems go here from everything we've heard from the company executives, from the engineers, from the people on the ground. This rocket is taking off tomorrow if everything looks good. Behind me is where the rocket is being stored in the shed they call the barn here. And then about a mile beyond that is the launch pad. That is where the rocket will be taking off. Um, Jeff Bezos and three crew members, his brother, Wally Funk, and Oliver Damon, will load into that crew capsule. It'll take off vertically, and then at some point midway uh, into that flight, the capsule will separate from the rocket. They'll both continue into space past the Kármán line, which is the international space boundary, and all of them will experience three to four minutes of weightlessness. The booster will uh, come back to Earth first, then the capsule will descend after it with parachutes, land, hopefully safely, in a cloud of dust. Of course, the big question is weather. As I mentioned, uh, there are clouds overhead. We drove through a thunderstorm last night. Apparently, that's typical of the afternoons and the evenings here. In the mornings, it's generally more clear. So launch time is set for 8 a.m. Central Time. And we're told if there are any delays, there's a few hour window uh, where they can uh, delay the launch an hour to maybe three hours. But if it gets anywhere past that, they're going to have to move it to the following day. Again, no signs of that at this point. It looks like all systems go, and we will be here live, uh, ready to bring that launch to you. We certainly will be. And of course, it was a little bit delayed when we watched Virgin Galactic, which you helmed as well. Talk to us about the journey of Jeff Bezos, of Blue Origin getting here, the amount of money spent. Of course, we've taken a lot of time to talk about the race in the last couple of weeks, but this has been a long time coming. Absolutely. Caroline, he founded this company in the year 2000 before SpaceX 21 years ago. This has been a long time, a long dream in the making. Bezos has talked many times about how it was his childhood dream to get to space. He grew up watching those Apollo missions to the moon, but there have been bumps along the way. There have been delays, there have been design challenges, and now finally, here we are. And what is interesting is that the vision that Jeff Bezos has for space is very different than what uh, Richard Branson has talked about, very different from Elon Musk. He imagines being part of building the road to space that would allow entrepreneurs and other businesses to create this future space ecosystem. He doesn't want to leave Earth. He thinks Earth is the best planet, the most beautiful planet. He doesn't want to go to Mars, but he wants to have the capability to live outside of Earth in order to protect Earth. The way he describes it is he says, we're going to run out of energy, we're going to run out of resources here, we need to get to space, um, move industry to space, for example, so that it can be powered by solar energy. We can use water from the moon and turn that into rocket fuel uh, to keep our missions going around and around. So that is very much his vision, Richard Branson, of course, is focused more on space tourism. Um, Elon Musk has talked a lot about getting to Mars, colonizing Mars. So that is where Jeff Bezos imagines Blue Origin fits into the, into the, into the piece of the pie. Um, but it'll be interesting to see whether or not his journey up and down changes him or that vision in any way. Quite the different philosophy. Emily, amazing. Stay well out there. We'll be having so much more from you throughout the show from Van Horn, Texas. Of course, that's Emily Chang. Now, let's talk about some of the other corporate news that was out there today. Robinhood hopes to raise up to $2.3 billion in an IPO. And the trading app at the center of this year's meme stock frenzy says it will sell more than 55 million shares. Robinhood expects the IPO to price between $38 and $42. At the top of the range, the company would have a market value, therefore, of $35 billion. Chris will see here to join us now. And it's so ironic that it's a company that has sort of dined out on the story of meme stocks. And you say one of the key risks it sees is becoming one itself. Yeah, like they were banking on, you know, to the moon. And this <laughs> is, again, like meme stock seems to, like the name suggests that it seems to be a short-lived uh, phenomenon, but it seems to have gone on for more than a year now. And that during that one year, it really had brought a lot of new um, audience, a lot of users, a lot of attention, and a lot of volume, trading volume to Robinhood. So the meme stock really had benefited them. And what they're warning now is, themselves because of the retail participation, it could have a lot of volatility in its stock and essentially becoming a meme stock. So we will see on the 29th, they will list on NASDAQ. So whether volatility will be an issue, it will be, we will know by next week.
give us a sense check, of course, your, the Women in Covers, all IPOs, whether this is a good timing. I mean, yes, we've had a volatile day in trading, but we're still near record highs, right? That's true. Taking everything into context, this is a very, very good year for IPO. Just in terms of volume, in the seven months, there are over 200 billion raised through IPOs and SPACs. So volume-wise, it's doing very well. And majority of the IPO are still up. Last week was a little bit of a bumpy week, and today was not the best. But they aren't pricing until next week, so the valuation won't be set until then. And from then on, it's really just the beginning. As they trade, the valuation could change. So 35 is, I would say it could be a full price even. Remind us who's making money out of this by going public. So Robinhood itself is raising the proceeds, it's, its primary proceeds. Um, but existing investors could also benefit from the valuation boost that they may get from uh, the, the first day trading and public market. So there will be a lockup. Uh, it is an IPO, it's not a direct listing, even though they are doing a very public investor day like a direct listing would. So all the lockup uh, still applies, um, but the company will be raising money and pretend investor, existing investor can cash out at a later time. CEOs as well, I'm sure. Well, remind us of just how much uh, retail shares are being offered to those who use the trading app. Yeah, so 20 to 25% 20 to 35% of the IPO is set aside for investors of, for users of Robinhood, which are usually the retail guys that have been behind the a meme stock frenzy. It's actually an unusually high amount. Most IPO reserve less than 10%, eight to 10% for retail investors. It is a very unconventional way. The banker will tell you that the long-term investors, the long only, the sovereign wealth funds, they are there to stay for the long term, therefore they're the better investors for an IPO and for a public company, but they're taking a very different approach. So this is an interesting experiment and see if it works out for them, it could work out for other companies. Talking of other companies, there was another company that was seemingly filing uh, to go public with its S1. Uh, the CEO of Rent the Runway actually was on Bloomberg Technology previously talking about the idea of going public. Let's just take a listen. I read the report yesterday in Bloomberg, which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I feel really appreciative that we're at a point where we're talking about our business being up 100% from that COVID low and our daily subscription numbers being back to or ahead of where they were in 2019. We are just building a long-term sustainable company and we're going to continue to make the best decisions for that long-term of Rent the Runway. So nothing is off limits. So seemingly back on June the 3rd, Jennifer Hyman of Rent the Runway wasn't disclosing whether indeed they were going to go public, but they still, it seems they are. Um, a good time to be coming. What, what do you expect for this particular idea? Well, I'm first of all very glad that our reporting was right, that they are indeed <laughs> going public. Um, today they announced that they confidentially filed to go public in the US, and um, we, we could, it could be a few months until they actually go public, and there's right now no indication of how much they're going to raise or what the valuation is, but this is another one that is banking on the reopening. Yeah. So uh, as we you know, go, go out again, we, as we go back to work, maybe there will be more interest in getting nicer outfits. Certainly is in my household. Crystal C, thank you so much. All over the initial public offering and SPAC market for us. Meanwhile, coming up, we'll take you back live to Van Horn, Texas, as we continue to count down to Blue Origin's suborbital space flight. But before we head to break, Zoom shares slipped after agreeing to buy a call center provider, 5.9, for $14.7 billion in stock. The acquisition will expand offerings from Zoom's popular video conference app as his workers begin to head back into the office and students go back to school. 5.9 makes cloud-based software that uses AI to help companies answer questions from customers and interact with them regardless of language, location, or device. It's all about the telephone, folks. This is Bloomberg. A different future starts with you. That's why GoDaddy does more to help you find a name. You can create, sell, and get found online so any small business can make a change. We need a new generation of thinking, your way of thinking. Start different at GoDaddy.com.
see that? Hello?